And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, a frequent visitor in the Brown Bag series uh, for many years, Tom Kaufman. Tom is an independent researcher, writer, and producer. He's a graduate in journalism from Kansas. And he's a reporter for both the Honolulu Advertiser and the Star Bulletin uh, before he became an independent writer and producer. His productions increasingly incorporated historic themes. Under the guidance of the legendary Hawaiian writer, John Dominus Holt, he began to integrate a chronology of the development of Hawaii, which led to the television documentaries, Oh Hawaii, From Settlement to Kingdom and A Nation Within. Uh, the book volume now known as A Nation Within Occupation. He has won national awards for production of video, film, uh, interactive media, and multi-image. Three of his books, A Nation Within, The Island Edge of America, and I Respectfully Dissent, received the Kello Awards for Excellence in Nonfiction from the Hawaii Book and Publishers Association. He has also received the Hawaii Award for Literature, the highest recognition given by the state of Hawaii for outstanding literary achievement. Today, he'll be talking about his book, Inclusion, the latest in a series of studies of the circumstances in Hawaii leading up and through World War II. And I'll let him explain that. I'll just add a personal note here. I've known Tom for quite a period of time. My first real contact with him was actually providing the voice of Sanford Dole in the documentary, A Nation Within. Um, and things have gone up or downhill since then. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with him over the years. Um, and he has contributed greatly to our understanding of the history of the kingdom and also the history of the uh, territory, um, starting from our understanding of contemporary politics with his important book, Catch a Wave, about the 1972 election for governor in the state. I'd also like to point out one other thing. Um, he's an independent producer, but he is hardly independent in the way that he works. Collaboration has always been a crucial aspect of what Tom has done. He has always worked with people, a nation within benefited greatly from the kind of consultation he did with Kanakamaoli scholars and whatever to provide, in some ways, almost for the first time, a detailed account of the kind of resistance that was going on at that time to annexation. Uh, on the work he's been dealing with today and other works having to do with the lead up to World War II. He's worked with people like Ted Tsukiyama and other people. Uh, so it's eyewitness and communication. Tom has been a great informer, a reporter, a communicator, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce him uh, at the time of the appearance of his newest work, Inclusion. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Tom Kaufman. Great. Thank you for that introduction, and thanks everyone for uh, for joining in. Um, I wish somehow we could be sitting around Craig's giant conference table, but I'm amazed that we actually have more people on Zoom than we could have ever gotten around the giant conference table. So there is a benefit to this uh, um, this new this new COVID world we're coping with. And uh, it means reaching out to new people. And I, I think I'm talking with many people here today who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting and then I'm talking to some old friends as well. So, um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Um, I have been invited over and over um, for um, uh, reasons that, uh, regarding biography. I'll, I'll try to explore a little bit. Um, but uh, my focus uh, today is, is on the book that the University of Hawaii Press brought out in mid-December. So it's been out about two months in, in, in a single word, it's called inclusion. Um, and it's in the era of the long title, of the long subtitle, I um, rolled the dice and I thought, what all do I really want to say on the cover page, and uh, I, it, the subtitle became 
how Hawaii protected Japanese Americans from mass incarceration transformed itself in the process and helped change America. And I'll try to talk about, about all of those things, but with an emphasis on the, the first step. Um, as context, um, um, you know, I should, I, I'd like to say that over my long writing life, uh, I've basically written about the overthrow and the, the overthrow and the forced annexation. Um, uh, in this book uh, about territorial Hawaii leading up to the inflection point of the war and segueing into statehood and then written a couple of books about that I think shed light on the uh, early statehood period and the changes that occurred in the transition from territory to statehood. Um, I'm gonna show a few slides and then do this maneuver, share, right? Okay. Um, bear with me. Um, bear with me. It's a Zoom challenge. Um, okay, I'll just do it this way. Um, so that is my long title. Um, Craig said that I work in collaboration um, with many people. I, I feel, while it sounds like uh, I maybe have been obsessed with an abstract notion of developing the history of Hawaii, um, my projects uh, over a period of, of 50 years of writing have very much come from my uh, community experience and other work experiences from personal relationships and so on. And in this one, I, uh, as Craig mentioned, I particularly uh, would like to thank Ted Sukiyama Ted uh, passed uh, a little over two years ago at the age of 99. And in the process, I think Ted knew more about the subject that I written about than uh, probably any other living person. He was a, a Roosevelt High School student, a UH student, a founder of the Varsity Victory Volunteers. He was a member of the 442nd and the Military Intelligence Service. So he was ubiquitous in his early life and he was uh, uh, devoted throughout his long life to uh, researching, analyzing and recording uh, the uh, transitional experiences that uh, he was engaged in. And so uh, it is to Ted I am particularly indebted. Um, so I should say in the vein of these being community projects, uh, I did not start set out to write about inclusion as a concept but rather was compelled by the question of how Hawaii navigated World War II and by extension, how contemporary Hawaii came to be. The title arose in the final edit in which I more fully realized that inclusivity held Hawaii together 
under the tremendous strain of war and laid the foundation for its evolution thereafter. The root question that drove the project to, and it was a 10-year project, it was a 10-year project uh, as a book project, as a film and book project, it was a 25-year project. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, it began with a conversation I had with Governor John A. Burns when I was a political reporter for the Star Bulletin and working on my first book, Catch a Wave. Uh, and it came back around when Ted Tsukiyama uh, came to the Japanese Cultural Center where we were doing baseline historical research and recording of Japanese American experience. And we did a long interview with Ted um, uh, expanding on my uh, acquaintance with him at that point. And he brought Hung Wai Ching, who I'll tell you about in a minute, who really exploded the subject in a big way. Um, we dealt with the root question, why did Hawaii have with less than a 2% incarceration of Japanese American, Japanese ancestry? That's an important difference actually. Japanese ancestry population contrasted to the 100% incarceration of people of Japanese ancestry on the West Coast. Um, so it's, it's, it became a sprawling subject and a sprawling inquiry uh, that went in many directions. I think most importantly, it went inside the community. And then the question was externalized to the West Coast for the comparison. And uh, then it was inevitably extended to Washington DC uh, because these were federal policy questions and because we were a, col a colonial territory. Um, I stress community, uh, I, I can't help but think um, about Ukraine. I think all of us can't help but think about Ukraine today. But if you step back, um, this, the, the story of Ukraine is being written above all by Ukrainians. And it is their strength that is authoring the story. And in that sense, I think Hawaii authored the story, its own story of World War II, importantly to ourselves and our future, uh, but also importantly to the United States. Um, I keep being invited kindly by Craig uh, to biography series um, and it is not that I'm a biographer, but I thought about, about that today as I was trying to prepare for this. And I thought that um, biography, if we, we think about biography, biography is typically about uh, a single person. Uh, it revolves around the events and lifetime and achievements of a single person. And in our shorthanding of history, uh, when we get far enough away from history, uh, history becomes a succession of 
biography. So Kamehameha is the great figure of Hawaiian island unification and the founding of the kingdom. And his four uncles, as they were called, are largely forgotten. Um, in the overthrow of the kingdom, Sanford Dole and to some extent, Lauren Thurston are remembered. Their 11 co-conspirators in the so-called community committee of safety are forgotten. Um, ensemble biography, I believe is more accurate if we are concerned with the most pressing question, which is how did change come about? What are the inflection points of history? And uh, how did they evolve? And I think these are more accurately revealed by, the, by considering the multiple of lives of networks of people who worked closely together. And from the cover, um, first person was the mentor of this network. Uh, the, for those of you at the university, he was the, you know, Hemingway Hall, uh, the lifetime uh, member of the Board of Regents, the father figure of the university for, uh, from let's say 1907 to 1947 for 40 years. Uh, and in his uh, almost parenting role or his lifetime devotion, uh, he got to know hundreds and hundreds of young people who went through the university most of whom were uh, non-white students. They were um, heavily uh, Asian American and some Hawaiian students, and then there were some Ali students. And from this lifetime of interaction, he went from being a big five executive to an advocate for an evolving a uh, multiracial community. And the quote that I love from him uh, was to a boardroom full of white executives in the early war, uh, moments of the war. And he said, we must get over the notion that white people are heaven sent to rule the world. I think his next sentence is most interesting because he acknowledges that he came from a white dominant society, a racist society, and that he evolved. So he said, I don't believe it anymore. Um, so this brings us to Hung Wai Ching, who Ted Tsukiyama brought into our studio at Japanese Cultural Center that day. Uh, Hung Wai Ching was a YMCA executive. He's, he's a uh, mentor of hundreds of young people. Uh, he was born in 1907. So he was a little bit of an older generation than the wartime generation. He was in his 30s by the time um, um, Hemingway involved him in the community effort that was devoted to uh, dealing with the po possibilities of a war between America and Japan. And uh, the educator, um, in this collaboration, importantly, was a man named Shigeo Yoshida. He is the least known figure in this story, 
And he's a, a figure I'm particularly delighted to bring out and illuminate because he was so far behind the scenes. Uh, but he was the writer and the, to many, to, to a great extent, the intellectual strategist of this effort. And he uh, wrote um, in, uh, as part of his voluminous writing and thinking out loud during the war. How we get along during the war will determine how we will get along when the war is over. So it was, a, it was prophetic. Um, I call John A. Burns the expert. He actually was identified by, um, by the executive officer of martial law and by, the, uh, by a national magazine writer and others as, quote, an expert in oriental thinking, um, meaning that the larger society uh, looking at Asian Americans as others uh, turned to people like Jack Burns, who were genuinely acquainted, genuinely knowledgeable. Uh, he, in his role as a uh, police captain, originally, um, for answers. Who are these people? Can they be trusted? And uh, one of the th basic things he told me in that original conversation was the FBI, which was investigating, was frustrated. It wasn't getting the information it needed. It couldn't communicate with local people. And therein lay his original role that joined him to the history of Hawaii. Uh, together, particularly uh, led by uh, Hemingway, Ching, Yoshida, uh, a Council for Interracial Unity, which more than a year preceded the war in the long run up to the war, uh, an ad hoc group saw war coming, feared it, but believed they could do something to shape Hawaii. They were devoted to minimizing oppression by maximizing participation in the war effort. So in one phrase, that became their strategy. And Yoshida, I've already read his quote, uh, produced the organizing phrase, how we get along will determine how we are going to get along. I, I would like to stress the level of peril that Hawaii was in after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Part of what motivated me in the writing was the superficiality of the community memory or the community discussion of the December 7th event. People talk about maybe they saw a plane flying by uh, and then they talk about we had to live through blackout and we had to carry gas masks and that is typically the extent of discussion. What is lost is that it was a, uh, a climate of intense fear in which morale became a life and death issue. And when I say in this, the, the government and the Council for Interracial Unity feared a downward spiral. The downward spiral went like this. They feared mass demoralization, of which there were many symptoms of mass demoralization. They feared that the, the people then would become 
depressed and withdrawn. And there was a good deal of that. They feared then there would be an alienation of Japanese Americans and of Japanese aliens of whom there were at that point still 40,000. So there were uh, about 120,000 Japanese Americans, about 40,000 first generation or recent immigrant. Um, and that this would be an alienation in their withdrawal and depression from family, community, and from the United States. And that then that could result in fifth column support for Japan, sabotage and espionage. So that is what this group of people dealt with in a word. And that is the, the unfolding story of the book. Um, Robert Shivers was the first of several very key people who were basically turned around by their acquaintance. So he came to investigate the Japanese community for disloyalty through originally through Mr. Hemingway and then through Yoshida and his cohorts and Hung Wei Ching and the networks of people that they introduced him to. He became a believer in the loyalty of Japanese Americans and the uh, probability that if Japanese uh, ancestry people were treated uh, with respect and with a level of trust that Hawaii could go through the war without a mass incarceration. And uh, secondly, at least I would need to cite General Delos Emmons, who was the martial law governor. He um, essentially began with great step skepticism and he uh, was similarly brought around and then became the most essential negotiator of the relationship between uh, Hawaii and the President of the United States who wanted a mass incarceration and was insistent of uh, mass incarceration over and over. And the War Department, which likewise sought a mass incarceration and steadfastly refused to allow the inclusion of Japanese Americans into the, uh, the military to exercise their right as Americans to fight for beleaguered America in the war. And so those elements set the stage uh, for the story. Um, I will jump through these very quickly, but I want to introduce them as uh, uh, discussion points. Um, uh, in the sense that the, all of this is about community strengths, which came into play. Uh, one of the roots, most uh, basic elemental was acquaintance, purposeful acquaintance of different people of different ethnic groups, getting to know one another. Um, second, I, I found a great deal of evidence that public schools, uh, the expansion of the public school system contributed enormously to this process. The most emblematic being McKinley High School. Uh, the University of Hawaii played an extremely important part in knitting together these relationships. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, Robert Shivers, the FBI agent, told 
Mr. Hemingway, chairman of the Board of Regents, um, get me six people you, that I can completely trust. And uh, Hemingway said, I can, I can give you 600. But he said, no, six, six people to advise me. And as if they were a representative sample, um, he generated six names. Actually, all six of these people had worked together with Yoshida on the school newspaper, the debate team, or the school annual. Uh, so it, to me, it was, it was an interesting example of how tightly woven together they were. Another very influential network was drawn from the YMCA. Uh, we are not ready to think of the YMCA today as being that influential, but it was enormously influential at that time. Um, there are uh, historical statements to the effect that the YMCA was more active in Hawaii than in any other place in not only the United States, but the planet, because it was a worldwide organization. Uh, the YMCA was very important to stimulating an internationalist point of view uh, the, uh, that resulted in for some of you may know about the Institute for Pacific Relations, um, also uh, the Pan-Pacific Union, the Pan-Pacific Movement generally, the hands around Pacific um, uh, Movement and the way in which internationalism demanded that Hawaii look at itself and its own racial relations. So that if you were an advocate of people around the Pacific getting to know each other and getting along, it led you to the question of uh, to what extent do we know one another in our own community and how well we're getting along. And so it stimulated a level of uh, intentional uh, getting to know one another that is those that lay foundation and I think is largely absent today. Um, the last uh, two um, have to do with federal agencies. Uh, the knowledgeable intelligence and internal security, which often makes us so uneasy because we are, um, it conjures images of people spying on one another. Um, but the fact that there was intensive uh, internal intelligence actually led the federal government to have, as, as events unfolded, to have greater confidence in Hawaii than in the West Coast. And the reason is that neither the Army or the Navy or the FBI had any extensive intelligence of what was going on there, as opposed to Hawaii, in which the intelligence agencies had done repeated studies and concluded that most people of Japanese ancestry could be counted on to be loyal in the event of a war with Japan. This was translated to the United States Army, importantly, on the ground, meaning the generals and uh, other high-ranking officers who came here and did things like from the, the start of the draft in 1939, 1940, 1941, began training Japanese American soldiers. And they arrived at uh, 
a viewpoint summarized by the words, trust begets trust. Trust begets trust. So we must engage with and show trust for and loyalty to young, eager Japanese Americans. And in turn, it will beget additional trust. So it becomes circular. Uh, so those are elements that set the scene. Uh, briefly, I, I, I emphasized my perspectives. Um, and so the long, there's a long lead up in the book about the territory of Hawaii. It's organized heavily around the biographies of Hung Wai Ching and uh, Shigeo Yoshida. And in the process, I think those biographies helped uncover some understanding of some of the dynamics of the territory, which generally we don't know much about, okay? There hasn't been much work done on the territory. In recent years, Hawaiian scholars at the university are starting to do important work on the territory from a Hawaiian viewpoint. And my hope is generally that territorial uh, history can be uh, greatly expanded. Um, then second perspective, Washington DC, uh, perspective of the turnarounds of federal officials and their interaction with Hawaii. And finally, uh, I do cover uh, uh, the battlefield of the 442nd and the 100th Battalion uh, in one chapter, uh, believing that there had been a great deal of military history already done, but that in the extension of the Nisei soldier into the battlefield, uh, I found uh, evidence and, and stories, I found stories of Japanese Americans carrying Hawaii's community values into their relationships and into the vitality of their fighting units, which came to distinguish them from, uh, from other fighting units in the uh, sectors of war that they were in, the horrendous sectors of war. And then finally, uh, uh, I mostly drew on my previous work on uh, the statehood period for uh, uh, a brief chapter on how I evolved from all of this and then interacted with the national government as a state of the United States. So with that, um, can I be rescued with, with questions and or comments? Um, and uh, we'll try to have a dialogue. All right, thanks very much, Tom. Um, it's a big canvas, obviously, and the book is a big book because of the detail that has to actually uh, go into it. Uh, but it seems to me it's very uh, clear where you're going with that. Uh, I was going to ask, it was something that you were sort of transitioning into at the end. Um, <clears throat> to what degree uh, or what would you say is the importance, the significance, or the the need to remember in terms of how Hawaiians were actually navigating all of these ideas and groups? I mean, to what degree did you find them participating in the kind of movements that you're talking about? And where was their positioning in relation to the kind of internationalism you're talking about, the kind of interaction within the community? Um, just where are the Hawaiians in this? Um, 
this is this is an extremely difficult. Uh, it's a it's a simple question on one level, and then it's an extremely difficult level uh, question on in terms of the underlying like real substance, and really uh, digging down. So uh, the second part of this is um, to a considerable extent. I don't know. Okay, and I I don't think the answer is known at this point. So I think that is a challenge to the Hawaiian research that's going on. Okay, but what I do know is there was a tremendous amount of Hawaiian participation in the early years of the territorial units that were National Guard units. So Hawaiians constituted uh, the largest number of uh, participants in those units in the early days. And um, so they, the, I think the warrior, you know, tradition of Hawaiian culture um, was at work in that. Um, the various key Hawaiians participated in facilitating the formation of the 100th Battalion and the 442nd. Um, one of the most prominent ones who did was um, uh, the general at uh, Schofield Barracks, Native Hawaiian, who uh, facilitated the formation of the first Japanese American um, labor battalion, right? And uh, when that labor battalion was formed, uh, one of the people who Hung Wai Ching uh, sought out to, to be a sort of morale officer of the Varsity Victory Volunteers, as they were called, was Uncle Tommy Kaulu Kukui, the football hero of UH at the time, later uh, a very beloved uh, person in getting the contemporary Hawaiian movement going. Um, the, there were several uh, sergeants in the early uh, training units who were part Hawaiian. And there were various part Hawaiian members of the 442nd. Um, and the Maui 442nd club has documented these to some extent. So there's a, a little thread of, uh, of relationship there. Um, the, the underlying reality is this is a period of tremendous marginalization of Hawaiians and Hawaiian-ness. And um, I think Global events, war, uh, the development of statehood, um, big global events, impinging events, tend to marginalize Hawaii's unique indigenous culture. And I think very much that's part of what was going on. Uh, at the same time, there was an appropriation of Hawaiian culture by Asian Americans uh, who spoke, for, first of all, I think in terms of relationship, so this is like the genuineness of it, who spoke very warmly and with great appreciation, the sense of acceptance and welcoming that came to them from Native Hawaiians. So the genuine sense of inclusion that flowed from Native Hawaiians to uh, Asian Americans who were emanating from the plantation culture. And there's, there's a lot of references in Asian American accounts to that. 
which I think, you know, we must say those are quite real. At the same time, uh, there was a kind of, of uh, conflation, if you want to use that big word, of democracy, which we didn't really have, with the Aloha spirit. So the Aloha spirit is kind of a, of a, a root practice, root passion, root value. And it fed the idea that we need to build an inclusive community. And uh, to the extent Hawaiians inspired the idea of inclusion, I think that was very important. So it was a kind of a aloha and democracy culture that was developing in the territory of Hawaii, thanks to Asian Americans and to a certain extent, their relationship with Hawaiians. Little to no thanks uh, to the white oligarchy with the exception of a few extraordinary people like Charles Hemingway. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I've got a bunch of questions here, and I'm going to give a number of them to you all at once because the you can figure out how you want to navigate them. But okay. um, it's tied to the notion of inclusion in some ways because all of the questions have, in some ways, the same concern with okay, if this is what happened here, why didn't it happen in California? Um, so that one, uh, Zoe said, you could play with the wording, but something like, has this given you perspective on why um, more of these things did not take place in California? And just piling onto that, all right, I wonder how that building of trust contrasts contrast to California West Coast. Seems there were many similarities compared to not. How did Hawaiians speak out for West Coast Japanese, or did they? And then, can I please ask for Tom to, to expand on the studies done to determine whether Japanese in Hawaii were loyal versus on the U.S. West Coast? Why were the studies done in Hawaii in the first place, and why were they not done on the continent? Or, thank you so much for the engaging information and informative talk today. I have a question about the U.S. Census Bureau's role in sharing confidential demographic information about Japanese American communities here and on the mainland. Did the sharing of information happen in Hawaii before and after December 7th, 1941? All right. And uh, then we've also got, but, but basically I think the, the larger question here is, you're pointing out very clearly that there were certain things that contributed to why Hawaii was different from the West Coast. What was it about the West Coast that seems to have made it impossible for similar results to be arrived at? You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna try a really big bite. Uh, it's not really in my book, okay? But um, let me let me start with like the history of the United States and work our work outward to the to to the West Coast and then to Hawaii, and I'll try to do it very briefly. The in the terms of the book, inclusion versus exclusion. The history of the development of the United States is basically uh, a progression of exclusionary practices, many of them brutal over to a certain point. And they begin with, you know, the, the Massachusetts colony uh, excluding and driving out uh, the native Indian population. And generally the United States government as it went, um, driving out uh, native Americans or exterminating them. And uh, with the whole paradox and inhumanity of slavery um, and progressing over to um, you know the, the Civil War and after the Civil War um, 
one of the big exclusionary movements was of uh, the attacks on the Chinese uh, immigrant population that he had spread around the American West in gold, gold mines and building railroads and uh, all sorts of other adventures. And the brutal, violent, racist attacks drove Chinese immigrants into uh, that was the origin of Chinatown. So it was like the San Francisco Chinatown, for example, the Los Angeles Chinatown. And simultaneous with, with that was um, the whole Jim Crow movement to basically reinforce, reinvent segregation and deprive freed African Americans of their full citizenship. And that exclusion was succeeded clear up into you know, the late 1960s in the civil rights movement. Um, and that was followed by the first efforts at excluding Japanese Americans, which occurred in 1907 in San Francisco. And the, um, the so-called, it was the San, the San Francisco school segregation issue, genteelly or confusingly in history, it's called the gentleman's agreement between Japan and the United States, but it was an agreement that Japanese uh, settlers in America not be segregated into um, into uh, ethnic schools, uh, like the Chinese had been segregated into ethnic schools in San Francisco. Uh, so it was an interesting beginning of pushback, and the pushback emanated partly from the the strength of the Japanese nation which had won a war against Russia in 1905. Um, and the strength of the Japanese nation, uh, the concern by people like Teddy Roosevelt that they might actually have to fight a war with Japan, which he didn't really want to do despite his bluster. And um, it extended to uh, uh, the development of a large Japanese American uh, community in Hawaii that was beginning to have some significant influence. There's, we're, we have this plantation story, uh, but the plantation story does not capture the way in which the, the large 35 to 40% of the population the large Japanese community that had developed before the war. And the, the uh, relationships of mutual acquaintance and in some instances, mutual regard and uh, influence that had occurred. And that is as opposed to the West Coast in which there was a much smaller Japanese American, Japanese population uh, scattered throughout the entire enormous American West. So they were essentially helpless by contrast, by virtue of being uh, less than 2% of the total population, but also being so widely scattered and so, for example, the Council for Interracial Unity organized a year plus ahead of the war. Uh, the so-called Fair Play Committee on the West Coast, which was supposed to help the Japanese uh, uh, community head off mass internment, 
really didn't organize until uh, a couple of months before the war. And then it was very weakly organized. It had a, a couple of YMCA people and a couple of Japanese American Citizen League people who were desperately running around trying to enlist support. And they uh, got members such as the governor of California, who subsequently became an advocate of mass internment. So they push back against mass internment, which is a most drastic and brutal form of exclusion, began in Hawaii. And I think that in that sense, there's been an unbro unbroken progression of ways in which Hawaii has influenced the rest of this country and set the pace for developing an inclusive society. So uh, that's a that's a that's a big yeah. Let's let's discourse. Let, let's set it up so you can hear me now. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't hear another. You. Uh, another uh, me with, uh, uh, you know, breaking that out some, but that's in broadest terms what I what I think I saw as I worked on this. Okay. Yeah. What I'm going to add uh, add in here is uh, somebody who said they were piggybacking off of something I was saying earlier about internationalism, Hawaiians' participation with that. You mentioned that this intentional getting to know each other was the foundation of Hawaii's relationships. And, and then you said, and how it's largely absent now. Uh, the question someone's asking is, in some ways, what did you mean by that? And what could be some of the reasons why that impulse toward knowing each other and internationalism seems to have been something that is in some ways retreated? Okay, what, what I think of as, you know, uh, documentable practices were, um, things like uh, uh, a simple, a vivid example is uh, three, three, three clubs. So they would get three people from one ethnic group and three people from another ethnic group and a third, and they would all sit around a round table and they would uh, simply share their life experiences as a beginning point to, uh, you know, becoming more acquainted, working together, uh, sharing um grievances or whatever they were um it, more uh abstract versions of that were things like the pan pacific union the ymca in which ymca had all sorts of leadership development clubs in which people shared life experience and um the institute for pacific relations which um and in its time was tremendously, it was begun in Hawaii and it was tremendously influential in Hawaii and throughout the Pacific. It was a soft, soft diplomacy or a soft power attempt to bridge the differences between Japan and the United States primarily uh, based on the initiatives of people in Hawaii who felt threatened by the increasing tensions. So those are, uh, you know, intentional acquaintances. Um, and in today's world, why, I, I think that we've become lulled by the cliche of uh, how well we get along with one another. And I think that in the process, we've overlooked um, the continuation of uh, uh, or we don't have segregated communities, but if you look at East 
Oahu versus West Oahu. The demographics are very different. West Oahu is very heavily non-white and, and East Oahu is very white. Um, and there is almost no uh, intentional effort that I know of to try to bridge that distance. Um, I think that uh, the revival of the Hawaiian community and the revival of the history begs a question of what is the relationship between uh, all of the rest of us and native Hawaiians. And I think um, this has not been dealt with at all by intentional, uh, by intentional dialogue. And so that's one of the things that goes top of the mind for me. Uh, we had a thank you from Lehua Patnadi, uh, thanking you for, you know, mahalo for rewording that for me so eloquently. And that was the distinction between uh, response in California and American history in relation to the situation in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk um, a little bit, I, I happen to know a little bit about this because our journal many years ago, and I know you're familiar with this, that when Colonel Patton, as in George Patton, was here, they were systematically organizing and detailing in the 1930s who they were going to arrest and pick up out of the Japanese American community. There were really extensive plans laid down and set up for precisely that kind of relocation and incarceration. I was wondering if you could talk about, because you, you talked earlier about the danger and the fear, right? Even paranoids have enemies and nobody was being paranoid at that point. Could you talk about the degree to which there already had been the, the, the foundations laid for some kind of really ca catastrophic, uh, catastrophic response? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, there were repeated pressures placed on uh, the military in Hawaii and um, and on the uh, territorial government um, to surveil the Japanese community, to cook up lists of who they believe were uh, security threats in the event of war. And uh, the story of uh, Patton uh, uh, was of him, um, you know, as, as I think Patton as a figure, historic figure is prone to do, sort of going off the deep end with it, which was uh, he uh, developed his specific list and then he proposed that uh, the people on this list, which shocked readers who read uh, the study, proposed that uh, people on the list would be bartered to Japan and for other prisoners of war. So they would be treated as prisoners of war and dealt with, dealt to Japan. Um, all of this occurred in, you know, like vectors of practice and thinking that were going on. Uh, but what I found, which I think is very important, is that. Um, Basically, the trend in the United States Army, every, every time they revised the war, the or Project Orange, which is we will fight a war with Japan, uh, they, the people on the ground, other than patent, in a progression that extended from the early 1930s, clear up through 1941, and then continuing on, uh, proposed uh, additional levels of, excuse me, of inclusion of Japanese Americans. Uh, Mike Slackman's uh, monograph greatly impacted people because of the explicit racism of George Patton and really created 
the history of the 30s for the US Army. And, you know, I'm certainly not an advocate for the Army. I, if anything, I hated being the Army, okay, as a reservist. But um, uh, I grudgingly came to see that it was, uh, it was not the salient history, it was not the telling history. And in fact, for, for people who want to research this further, I would really urge on them uh, a history by a, uh, a person named Brian Lynn, who wrote Guardians of the, I think it's called Guardians of the Pacific or something like that. But uh, he had great detail on this uh, increasing um, willingness and desire to involve Japanese Americans. And part, and part of it was not, you know, it, it wasn't really, you know, uh, uh, all just nice relationship, but it was um, the United States, um, in our bigger picture, the United States in, 19, in 1898, when it enveloped Hawaii, acquired a Pacific empire that it was not prepared to defend. And uh, the, the Russian-Japanese War of 1905 um, was remarkable for the fact that Japan transported 100,000 soldiers uh, and surprised the Russians and won their war. And so the security analysis was uh, Hawaii needed a garrison of a hundred and some thousand people just to defend Oahu when the garrison was 10,000 to 12,000 or so. And so part of this thing of, you know, probing or looking for uh, loyal Japanese Americans was to, uh, pro to find soldiers who would defend the overextended American garrison. Yeah, and I just point out, we have to um, end thing now and respect uh, people's time. Uh, but I did want to point out that there was one final question in, which was what, ha what happened to the HIA soldiers and sailors who were already active in, in active service after Pearl Harbor? Harbor. Uh, I know uh, there's been a great deal, and Ted Sukiyama, as I remember, was involved in it. What happened to the, the Varsity Victory volunteers were actually uh, uh, Japanese-American guys who were literally disarmed and actually booted out of their military service as being potential security risks, and they basically had to set up a kind of uh, parallel structure uh, to demonstrate they were maintaining military discipline, even if the military wouldn't even let them hold guns. Uh, were, were there many active duty? I mean, because they, for the most part, were in reserve, right? Yeah. Okay, so the much less well-known history is that the United States government instituted the first peacetime draft. And as a feature of the, of the peacetime draft law, under pressure from the NAACP, the National uh, Advancement of Colored People um, included a provision in the law that said people cannot be excluded from the draft by virtue of race. And so suddenly there were about 2,000 Japanese Americans who were drafted prior to the war and trained in combat, um, many of whom were still in uniform when the war started. And these were like little known because their, their story was not developed at that point, but they were part of uh, federal National Guard units that were out, outside the, um, the periphery. They were on the neighbor islands and rural places and so on. So uh, they weren't so well known, but they were mobilized uh, as the 100th Battalion when Emmons did his turnaround and it was very early in all of this history. It was um, I don't know what that, very early in all this history. And it explains why the 100th Battalion 
was in combat much, much longer than the 442nd. But the more difficult you know, problem to overcome was, okay, varsity victory volunteers, they were turned out and they were very upset. They gathered together through Hung Wai Ching and Shigeo Yoshida and others. And uh, we were eventually regrouped as the 442nd. The 442nd became a much bigger story in terms of basically, you know, the national, the national government developed a self-interest in uh, propagandizing the positive contributions of Japanese Americans for a variety of important reasons. Okay. I'd like you all to join me in the sort of cone of blackness and silence in thanking Tom. Uh, we had a very, very good turnout and it's always wonderful to hear Tom in some ways uh, tell us our stories, which he brings back to us from that kind of close collaboration and careful work that he's been doing for decades. So I hope we will see you next week and in the future and uh, thank you all for attending. Aloha. Thank you everyone. Okay.